taxi company and they just go how many hours they want and then they pay certain money certain amount of money to the to the company that they rented the taxi car right taxi vehicle right yeah true <laughs> but maybe they want to maybe they want to ensure some like a minimum wage at the least make sure that they meet certain income level yeah and I think the benefits are important too, because I think uh, Uber drivers go to the hospital and then the, the government has to pay for their health care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's complicated. But the thing is, if that's the case, then like if somebody just do it as a side job, are they going to get also paid? Then they have their own job. It's kind of how you distinguish that, right? Right. Good it's question. Hard. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, May we should get started. So, hello everybody. Welcome to the USF Transition Seminar. And my name again is Yu Zhang, an associate professor in civil and environmental engineering. And this seminar is sponsored by the CE department, Cutter. The two UTCs uh, at USF, one is uh, TOMET and one is a CTEC. And also uh, it's facilitated as well by the IT student chapter and the WTS student chapter. So today, um, it's our pleasure to have Dr. Kenneth Koo. And uh, Dr. Kenneth uh, worked in different locations and at different sectors. He worked as a professor in Australia and then a senior uh, consultant and a researcher at Rand Corporation. And then later as the uh, um, data scientist at Uber. And now he, um, moved it to another company, which I will let Kenny say more about that. So we, we're we very glad to have you, Kenny, and look forward to hear your presentation about the sharing mobility. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Dr. Zhang. Um, so uh, Dr. Zhang approached me about possibly speaking in the seminar series, and I was uh, very happy to accept um, more as like a private citizen than as somebody representing my current company or companies I've worked at in the past. Um, uh, like Dr. Zhang alluded to, like I've worked at a lot of transportation engineering adjacent jobs, and some of these jobs and some of these companies I didn't know about when I was a student. Um, there are companies and jobs where like transportation engineers don't always work, and where not all of the employees are transportation engineers, but where knowledge of transportation engineering is actually really helpful. And I think there's like a real opportunity here to connect transportation engineers to tech and to connect transportation engineers to the type of work that's done at a place like the Rand Corporation, right? Um, so my, the title of my talk is, is a little uh, technical and awkward, but basically I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about like who I am and what I've done in the past. Everybody loves talking about themselves, right? Um, but this is also kind of what I was talking about before. Like I want to um, maybe start some trains of thought and some discussions about how we can kind of bridge the gap between what tech does and what transportation engineers do. Um, and then I want to dig into two very specific transportation optimization problems. So these are the types of problems that people solve uh, at places like Uber or Lyft. Um, so I want to talk about the assignment problem and the vehicle routing problem. Um, and in both cases, I want to talk about what these are theoretically, like the math behind them, what they look like, what they, um, how we formulate them and talk about them. But I also want to talk about if you work at a place like Uber or Lyft, uh, what you might be asked to do that's kind of related to the assignment problem or the vehicle routing problem. Okay. Um, and the assignment problem is much simpler. So I'll start with that. And like as time allows, we'll get into the vehicle routing problem. But people have spent their whole careers studying the vehicle routing problem. So we might not um, get into all the like nitty gritty details. Okay. So about myself, <laughs> um, I studied math in college and uh, a lot of what I do is basically math applied to transportation systems and like how do we optimize transportation systems by <clears throat> tweaking various uh, parameters and you know how do we represent transportation systems mathematically. Um, but I got into transportation a bit randomly. So even math, I got into a bit randomly. I was never sure what to study in college. I like the kind of black and white nature of math. Like you have a problem um, and then you solve it and you either get the solution or you don't. And when you finally like things start to click and you finally get a solution, that's a really satisfying feeling. Um, 
So if you know math, you can definitely go into transportation engineering. Um, where I went to college, there actually wasn't transportation engineering. So if you're a student now and you're in a transportation group, like you're way ahead of the game as far as like in comparison to me. Um, but when I went to graduate school, I learned about this wonderful area of transportation engineering. And it was, it was like instantly very appealing to me. You could apply math um, to transportation problems and you could make the world a better place. You could make our transportation systems safer, more efficient, right? So that, that really appealed to me. Um, in particular, like the area of applied math that I work in is called operations research. So how do you minimize or maximize a certain function? Um, and there's a lot of people like Dr. Zhang that apply operations research to transportation. Um, so when I was in school, I studied infrastructure management. Like how do we decide when to maintain roads and bridges? Um, that's one example of like how you can apply math to transportation, but there's many more. Um, and there was this weird synergy at, when, when we were students between like the infrastructure people like myself and the air transportation uh, people like Dr. Zhang. So in both cases, we were applying operations research to transportation systems. Um, right. Okay, so like we've been talking about, I had a lot of different jobs and I'm not trying to brag here. Actually, like I haven't progressed very far up the corporate ladder. Like this is not a recipe for success to like bounce around like I did. But it's been very interesting and like I've found a lot of uh, jobs and companies that I didn't know about before. Um, this might be a good strategy if you want to like maximize your learnings or if you're just curious like like I was and am. Um, so after graduate school, I worked at NASA on air traffic management and um, this came about because of conversations I had with people like Dr. <coughs> there was a whole group of people at Berkeley studying air traffic management and they worked closely with like this little uh, group at NASA that happened to be nearby. And so like I started to get involved in those conversations. I worked for a few years at NASA studying air traffic management. Um, it sounds very different than what I did before, but it's actually very similar. It's like operations research applied to transportation. Um, that whole time I had in the back of my mind that I wanted to be a university professor. Like that's kind of what you, that's kind of like the default goal when you're in graduate school. And so I left NASA to take a, a academic position, a tenure track position overseas. Um, like we talked about, uh, that was fun. Uh, it was actually in New Zealand. New Zealand is beautiful. I love New Zealand. Um, I was there for three years and I studied public transportation. I studied traffic flow theory because like those were the things that were most relevant uh, in New Zealand, right? Um, those were areas of transportation engineering that I hadn't studied before, but you know, I like to bounce around and learn new things. So that was really fun. Um, I had to return to the US uh, largely for personal reasons. So after three years in New Zealand, I came back to the United States. I actually didn't have a job. Again, I was kind of bouncing around for a little bit. Um, and I ended up at a place called the RAND Corporation. So if you've heard the term think tank, um, RAND is the, you know, it was the first think tank. So the government asked RAND to think about uh, big topics. So like one project I worked on there was how can the United States government help Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. So I worked at RAND for over six years. It's like a really fascinating uh, place. Um, you, you do lots of little research projects when you're at RAND. Um, they also have a, a small graduate school attached to the company. So this is a great example of something that like I didn't really know about when I was a student, but um, if I had known about it, I might have tried to go there. It's like a fascinating little um, graduate school. Uh, if you're interested in, in like helping improve the government, I would recommend checking out RAND and checking out the graduate school there. Um, so I was at RAND for over six years, which is a long time for me. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating place, but it felt like there was more interesting stuff happening in, in Silicon Valley and in tech. So for the past two years, I've been a data scientist. I was at Uber for a year, and more recently, I'm at a company called Scoop. So Scoop helps people carpool to work together. Um, and it's really about like getting people from home to work in an efficient, um, in a fun manner. Um, there's three different people with backgrounds in transportation engineering at this at this pretty small startup. Actually, four. There's four different people, if you, including myself. So there's like a good transportation engineering component at Scoop, which is one of the things I really like about it. Um, it's really has an awesome corporate culture. It's a cool company. If you like carpooling, you should check it out. <laughs> um, yeah, but so I guess the point here is that I've had all these different jobs and I didn't know about them ahead of time. 
these companies weren't necessarily looking for transportation engineers, but like knowing, having a background in transportation engineering ended up being like enormously helpful. So like, I think there's some space here to connect transportation engineering and tech or transportation engineering and public policy. Okay, so now I've got four slides like trying to graphically show what I did at each of these jobs. Um, so this is when I worked at NASA. Um, it was very like open-ended research. And one of the main things we were interested in is, is what, what we called the translation problem. So given a weather forecast, can you translate that into what might happen to the nation's air transportation system in some kind of like quantitative way? So um, we had a, NASA has a field station at, at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. So there's a pretty strong connection between NASA Aviation Research and Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. So we started to look at like what happens at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport when there's bad weather. And these are two plots I made of aircraft trajectories, looking at aircraft landing at Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, and on the left is what these trajectories look like on a good weather day. Um, so aircraft approach the airport at what are called the corner posts, like a, in these very specific locations in the corners of the airspace around the airport. Um, and the air traffic controller is like, make sure this happens and it's very predictable and orderly. And then on the right, I made a similar chart, but I looked at what happens when there's bad weather. And you can see everything kind of goes haywire. Um, and so my job here was to kind of put numbers behind this and like explain this in charts and in figures and in numbers. And so I looked at like what happens to the corner post and you see when there's bad weather, aircraft stop using the, the corner post. And that's because air traffic control and because of pilot decision making and there's like a lot of factors but um it's like a fascinating uh research project and in order to study it you have to know something about math and you have to know something about aviation and you have to know something about uh you have to be able to code because a lot of this is like computer programming so you have to kind of merge all these areas um yeah so when i went to canterbury i got very interested in public transportation and this was back when cities were first starting to like uh, publish data on where their buses and trains were in real time on the internet. So one of the first things I did was I like downloaded data that San Francisco was posting on the internet about where their buses and trains were located. And then I was able to try to analyze that data and try to say like, where is service good versus bad? And again, it was very similar. It's like getting some data, plotting it, analyzing it, I'm trying to put numbers behind like some of the things I was seeing in the data, right? So this is a movie of the locations of buses and trains in San Francisco over the course of a, a given day. And you can start to see like where is service good versus bad. Um, by the way, I made this uh, video, especially for this presentation, and it took all of two or three minutes. So um, if you're interested in like geospatial data, there's this tool that we used at Uber called Kepler, and it's open source now, and it's like, very easy to use, very powerful. If you want to visualize some data on a map, like it's, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's, it's like a very good tool. So I use Kepler now probably at least once a week at my current job, uh, anytime I have like geospatial data. Okay, this is an example of what I did at RAND. So um, there's a lot of uh, risk of flooding in coastal Louisiana. So this is a map of coastal Louisiana and it shows the 100 year flood depth according to like our best current estimates. Um, and the federal government asked RAND to kind of look at data like this and think about what the government could do to help. So the government could provide money to people so they can put their houses on stilts. You see that a lot in Louisiana, like people put their houses on 10 foot high stilts so that when there's flooding, the water goes underneath the house and doesn't actually damage the house itself. Um, the federal government can also pay people to try to incentivize them to move out of like especially dangerous areas. Um, that's pretty contentious, but it makes a ton of sense in some areas where there's just like no real way to reduce the risk. Um, the federal government is also interested in building like levees or flood walls, but then there's a question of where those levees and flood walls go. Um, if you, you know, basically they just protect certain areas, but shift water to other areas. So you can think of like, many combinations of different sets of levees and flood walls that the government might want to build. And you can see like what the results are of putting levees and flood walls in different areas. Um, so this was like a lot of my work at RAND wasn't transportation specific, 
but if you knew something about transportation, it was really helpful. So like I was the only person on this particular project that had a background in transportation. And so I could tell like, are there things we can do with regards to like road design that would help uh, mitigate flood risk? Okay, um, so unfortunately, like a lot of the more interesting stuff I've done, especially recently, I, I can't talk too much about. Um, so like I worked for a year at Uber and I worked on this very specific project called the Uber bus. Um, it's a, basically what it sounds like. It's like a bus service run by Uber. Uh, that would probably be illegal in the United States, but there's a lot of countries where private companies can run uh, basically public transportation services. So we launched it in Cairo, Egypt and Kiev, Ukraine. Um, Cairo is a, is a massive city, super interesting. Um, so I spent a lot of my time looking at Cairo and looking at like, how do we, uh, figure out like where to have good bus service and how frequently to run the buses. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, about that, but I can't say much because a lot of it is like, you know, corporate, uh, I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> um, okay. So that's kind of at a high level, some of the things I've done and I tried to show like visually what that work looks like sometimes. Basically it's a lot of, um, gathering data, coming up with, metrics that we might want to track and like putting numbers behind hypotheses that people have. Um, some of it is is solving very specific problems like mathematical problems. So you can represent situations in the real world as like an optimization problem. Um, if you've taken classes with Dr. Zhang or, or worked with her on research problems, I mean, you know this better than I do, but there's some very specific like transportation optimization problems uh, that I've worked on and that come up again and again. Right, so one of them is, is called the assignment problem. Um, and I'll talk about that first. And in Silicon Valley, we often talk about matching and matching, like the assignment problem is something that comes up when you're doing matching. Uh, so matching just means like, how do you match two different groups of people? It doesn't even have to be two, but how do you match like groups of people or, or requests or how do you match things that are, and say like one thing goes with another, right? So this comes up a lot in shared mobility in systems like Uber or Lyft. Um, it definitely comes up at Scoop where we're trying to make carpools, right? You have to decide like which driver goes in a carpool with which rider. Um, so there's ways to kind of talk about this, but like eventually it boils down to basically a math problem, like which rider goes with which driver and which rider does not go with which rider, right? So basically you can formulate the underlying situation using math. Uh, and there's different ways to do this, but there's a couple like famous uh, kind of classical ways to approach this and to formulate the problem. And then once you formulated it, you solve it. So first you kind of list out the equations that describe what's going on, and then you try to solve the problem uh, using mathematical techniques. So there's various ways to formulate the problem. There's various algorithms you can use to solve the problem. Okay, so I'll go into the math here. Um, Basically, you have one way to think about this, kind of the classical way to think about this, is that you have certain information that's given to you, and then you have certain decision variables that you're deciding about. So the information that's given to you, um, like the classical way to think about this, is that you have a bunch of drivers and you have a bunch of riders, and there's a certain time it takes for each driver to go to each rider. So that's what we call a model parameter. Um, here I'm saying it's T subscript I subscript J. So that's the time for driver I to pick up rider J. And you can think about like if you have an Uber like service, you have all these drivers in different locations, you have all these people who want to take a trip in different locations, and then you want to pick, you want to match the drivers so that the drivers can pick up the riders like basically as soon as possible. So you want to um, take these TIJ terms and you want to pick out the smallest of them. Um, so to do that, you have this decision variable, which is basically like for any specific driver and any specific rider, does this specific driver pick up this specific rider? So I'm calling that here A subscript I subscript J. And the idea here is we want A I J to be one if and only if we're telling driver I to go pick up rider J, right? If rider I is not gonna pick up, if driver I is not gonna pick up rider J, then A I J should be zero. Um, so once you have these model parameters and these decision variables, you can like represent the, the basic matching problem like really compactly and simply. Um, you just want to minimize the sum of the pickup times. 
So this is minimizing uh, what happens when you multiply Tij by Aij, and then you take the sum of all those multiplications. You take the sum over all riders and all drivers. Um, and then you have some like constraints. So some things that have to be true in order to have like a reasonable solution to this problem. So one of these constraints uh, might be that you pick up every rider, that you assign some driver to pick up every rider. So every time somebody opens the Uber app and makes a trip request, you've got some driver that you're telling to go pick up that person. Right? So you can represent that mathematically pretty easily. You just say for every rider J, uh, there has to be some of the of these AIJ terms that's one. So the sum over all the AIJ terms equals one for any rider J. Right? And then you have like the the flip, uh, like the reverse of that, which says that um, okay, now you have every rider being picked up, but you you don't want like one driver to be responsible for picking up every rider. So you have this other constraint that says um, for every driver, if you look at them like one at a time, um, they can only pick up at most one rider. So the sum of the AIJ terms for every specific driver is going to either be zero or one. Um, and this is just one formulation. Like you can imagine uh, tweaking this depending upon like what your what kind of service you're providing. But like this is what we call the unbalanced assignment problem. It's kind of like a classic problem in transportation optimization. Okay. Um, so at a company like Uber or Lyft, you'll formulate a problem like this, and then you'll find a way to solve this problem, which is to figure out like what's the optimal way to match riders and drivers. What's the best way I can assign the drivers to go pick up the riders? And you can do this a couple different ways. Um, you can code up your own solver and like base it on an existing algorithm. So there's a lot of research done by people like Dr. Zhang who um, have studied these problems and like defined good algorithms for finding solutions. So for this particular type of problem, for an assignment problem, you can use something called the Hungarian algorithm. You can use the Blossom algorithm. Um, you can use something called the Hopcroft Hup carp algorithm. Um, if you formulate it right, uh, you can actually forget about the constraint that these decision variables have to be between zero, have to be zero or one, uh, and you can make them be any like real valued number, and then you can use linear programming to solve the problem. Um, so linear programming is basically a whole field of, of solving mathematical problems where all the functions are linear, and it turns out it's actually much easier to solve linear programs than uh, problems that are not linear, right? So there's a bunch of different algorithms specifically for solving linear programs. Um, you can also just like code up the problem that you're trying to solve and give it to a, a like a software that's specially designed for solving these kind of optimization problems. So there's a one called Garobi. There's uh, IBM has a, a software called Cplex that solves optimization problems. Uh, Google now has a, a what we call a solver for solving these types of optimization problems. So um, if you don't want to code up your own algorithm, you can just code up the problem and like throw it at one of these uh, pieces of software. Okay. okay, so that's all great in theory, but what do you do when you're working at a place like Scoop or or Uber or Lyft? Um, so what what I found is a lot of times um, you're responsible for like adjusting the kind of problems that you've coded up and the solution strategies that you have. You, you have to adjust those problems and solution strategies based on something that happens in real life. So like this was an example from uh, six or seven weeks ago where there was a newspaper story that um, Amazon drivers were hanging their smartphones in trees, right? And if you think about it, um, this makes perfect sense. You're trying to match up uh, riders and drivers. The people who are driving for a service like Uber or who want to deliver packages for Amazon, um, they want to get as much business as possible. Like they want your solution to the assignment problem to involve like asking them to go do something, right? So in the case of Amazon, they have distribution centers and they're asking people to take goods from the distribution centers to people's homes. Uh, and if you are a driver, you wanna get that job, right? It's extra money, um, you signed up for this, this is exactly what you want. Uh, and you know that the way the system works is it looks for the closest driver to the distribution center and it asks them to go pick up the, the goods, right? So what you might wanna do is stick a phone very close to the, up to the distribution center and then you're always the closest driver to the distribution center, even if you're not actually 
with your phone, right? Um, so this is an example of like people trying to game the, the system. And as a data scientist working at a tech company, um, you might see something like this and you might try to change the math that you're using to solve the assignment problem to try to prevent uh, people from doing this, right? Um, so I have three whole slides on complications that arise from uh, like in real life when you're trying to solve something like the assignment problem. Because like basically this is what a lot of your job is as a data scientist at a tech company. Um, or even like if you're at a place like the Rand Corporation and you're analyzing, you know, what's going on in society, what you end up doing a lot of times is like trying to model or uh, adjust your algorithms based on what happens in real life that maybe was not captured in the in the research literature or that you didn't study in school. Right? So like, for example, in that formulation of the assignment problem that I went over, we had these model parameters that was basically like, how long does it take each driver to pick up each rider? Um, well, if, if you're operating at, at like the scale of Uber, you're getting millions of people asking to be picked up uh, and I think every day. And so like calculating how long it takes each driver to pick up each rider, um, that can actually be challenging just on its own. And you might say like, oh, I'll just ask Google Maps. But if you're asking Google Maps uh, for some information like millions of times a day, um, they're going to ask you to pay a small fortune. So maybe you don't want to ask Google Maps every time. Maybe you want to develop your own method for estimating pickup times. Um, and then you have to do it very fast because as we'll see in a couple slides, like in real life at a company like Uber, these things are happening in real time. So you, somebody opens up their phone and they make a request for a trip on an, on an Uber. Um, you have to know like very fast which driver is going to pick them up. And you have to base that on this assignment problem. So you have to know like very fast, you have to know how long it would take each driver to pick up each rider. Um, okay, so there's, there's a lot more complications that I've only covered one. <laughs> but um, one thing that, that comes up is like, what do you tell users before you've solved the assignment problem? So somebody opens up their, their Uber app and they want to take a trip. Um, it might be worthwhile to tell them before you've decided which driver is going to pick them up, it might be useful to tell them like about how long they'll have to wait to get picked up or like about how long their trip is going to take. But like what information do you have before you've solved the assignment problem? What information can you show them? Um, like this is a classic data science problem. Um, and then there's this kind of overarching issue of when you start operating at scale and you start getting millions of people asking for a trip and millions of drivers out there around the world looking to drive people, uh, a lot of the kind of math breaks down. So it, it becomes impossible to quickly solve the assignment problem when you have millions and millions and millions of, of riders or drivers. So then you have to start thinking about, well, what do you do in, in that case where like maybe it's no longer feasible to store in the memory of a computer like everybody's trip request. Okay, so a big complication that arises in real life in a lot of these uh, services is that you don't have all the information up front ahead of time and you have to make decisions uh, in, in what we call an online fashion. So you have to make decisions as time goes on. Um, so you might think that's not a big deal. You can just solve the assignment problem every minute or every two minutes. Um, but there's a couple issues that come up very, very fast when you try this type of approach. So one thing is like, if you're going to solve the assignment problem every minute, can you collect the data, do all the math, do all the calculations, solve the assignment problem, um, actually do the assignments? Can you do this within the span of a minute or, or 30 seconds? Um, and it becomes very tricky to like get the calculations fast, fast enough. Um, and then there's a, like a practical problem here, which I think transportation engineers uh, are in a particularly good position to think about, which is um, basically like if you're thinking about the problem that a company like Uber faces, if you want to resolve the assignment problem every minute, you've got a lot of drivers out there looking to you know, work on the Uber platform, and you've only got a, a small number of people who actually in that moment have their app open and are looking to be picked up and take a ride. So you've got this huge like imbalance, right? And if you waited some more time, um, that imbalance would get a little bit better. You'd collect more rider, more trip requests, um, and you'd have more riders relative to drivers. Like the imbalance would get a little bit better. But now you've waited some time and you've delayed everybody, right? So there's this like trade-off between like how long should you wait to collect more information 
versus how frequently should you do the optimization. Um, and, you know, practically speaking, this is a huge issue. And I tried to look for research, transportation engineering research on this, and I, I couldn't really find much. So this seems like a great area where like transportation engineering researchers could really help out uh, like the practice of, of how a, a shared mobility service operates. Um, so another decision that shows up in practice that I haven't really seen addressed in, in, in the transportation engineering research is like, when and where should we reconsider decisions? So if you solve the, op the assignment problem every minute, like maybe initially I told Bob to go pick up Jane, but then I look a minute later and actually now I'm not so sure that was the right decision. Now I have more information. Maybe there's new riders, new drivers showing up. Uh, should I reconsider that decision that I made previously? Probably in certain circumstances I should, but in other circumstances I shouldn't. So like this idea of like, when should I reconsider the decisions that I've made in the past? Um, it's something that's like enormously important in practice, but I haven't seen too much um, transportation engineering research around these types of questions. Um, yeah, so in real life, riders and drivers are constantly moving around. Again, like not something I see a lot of people think about, but like that's a huge issue in practice. Um, so what about if you could ask riders to walk? So this is shown up at Uber and at Scoop and at you know, it shows up at a lot of tech companies that are interested in shared mobility. So you have these drivers that are going around picking people up, dropping them off. Um, if you could get riders to move just a little bit, maybe you could have like a more efficient system where the drivers wouldn't have to drive as far and you could save everybody some time. But like, are people willing to walk and how far should they walk and where should they walk to? Where should they get picked up? Where should they get dropped off? Like these are all uh, really important questions in practice. Um, yeah, and then there's these kind of larger other issues like pricing, right? So it turns out there's all these interconnected, um, there's all this interconnectedness between like how you price rides in a shared mobility system and how you solve something like the assignment problem, right? If some poor driver has to drive halfway across the city to pick you up, um, you're wasting a lot of that driver's time. Like, should that be priced into uh, what the price of your particular trip is, is going to be on the shared mobility system? Like, how should we manage pricing? Um, that's a whole other area of, uh, of like transportation engineering. <laughs> Okay, um, so now I'm going to talk about the vehicle routing problem. Um, it's an, again like another mathematical problem that represents uh, like a particular aspect of transportation systems um, and one that's like really common at tech companies, but um, but it's, it's bigger than tech companies, right? Like if you think about how UPS delivers your mail, like they're basically solving something like the vehicle routing problem. Right, so in the vehicle routing problem, you basically have a bunch of drivers and you have a, a bunch of uh, riders or, or goods and the drivers have to go pick up the riders or the goods and move them around. Um, and each driver can pick up multiple riders or multiple goods. So like in this image that I'm showing here, the gray diamonds are supposed to represent vehicles or drivers and they each one of them is responsible for doing a number of things. So they go pick up a rider, they take that rider on a trip, drop them off at their destination, um, and then that particular vehicle or driver goes and picks up another rider, and then it takes that other rider to their destination. And so the vehicle routing problem is basically figuring out the optimal paths for all of these drivers. So you need to basically decide on a bunch of different things. You need to decide like something like the assignment problem, like which riders go with which drivers. But then you also need to order those riders. So like maybe I know that Bob is going to pick up John and David, but does he pick up John first or does he pick up David first? Like that's another question that you need to answer. Um, and then you also have to think about timing. So like when do these things happen? And like am I defining like a, a reasonable sequence of events? Okay. So mathematically we can represent this just like how we thought about the assignment problem, we can use some uh, model parameters and some decision variables uh, and then code up some like system of, of mathematical equations that represent what's going on here. Um, so in this case, I'll start with the decision variables and there's two kind of obvious ones. One is like 
what time do things happen? So in this case, I'm saying B subscript J is the time at which a particular rider J is going to be picked up. And this is something I want to determine like as I go through this optimization problem. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a particular version of this problem where we actually have a choice. Like we can choose to pick up a rider or not pick up a rider. So it's a model this. I'm using another decision variable, uh, A subscript J. And this says, like, am I actually going to pick up rider J? I want to set this variable to be one if and only if I'm going to pick up rider J. Um, so th those are kind of the two most obvious decision variables. But then there's other decision variables that you have to consider to kind of make the formulation work and make everything make sense. So uh, one way to think about this, and there's many ways you can think about this, but this is one way, um, is to think about these other binary variables. So like, in this case, I'm using two sets of binary variables. Um, C subscript I subscript J, this is a binary variable, and I want to set it to be equal to one if and only if I'm going to ask driver I to pick up rider J, and it's going to be like the first thing I ask this driver to do. Right? So that the first thing I ask Jane to do is pick up David, uh, C, Jane, David would be set equal to one. Um, and then I have a separate set of variables, and this one is, is looking at like a pair of riders. So I want to set D subscript J subscript K. I want to set this variable to be equal to one if I'm going to pick up J and then take them on their trip, drop them off, and immediately afterwards I'm going to pick up rider K and take them on their trip. Um, so this is kind of a, it's not the most obvious way to formulate this problem and think about this problem, but it's actually really efficient because um, I only have to think about two things at a time, right? I have to think about for each driver and rider, like what's the first thing that driver does? Does it pick up that rider? Is that the first thing that driver does? And then if I know the first thing that each driver does, then I can construct a, I can construct a schedule for them based on these, the second set of variables. So like if I know David picks up John first, and then I know that Larry comes after John, then I know that initial driver, sorry, I forgot his name, but he's going to pick up David, and then he's going to pick up John, and then I can like construct his whole schedule if I know these two variables. Right. Um, and so then the rest of the formulation, I have some model parameters and some equations that are basically using the decision variables. So in this case, we'll be maximizing a reward, and it could be like the profit of your company, or it could be the revenue that you're generating, um, or it could just be like the number of, of people that you're able to serve in this shared mobility system. But basically, you maximize some reward. And that reward should be related to your decision variables. So in this case, I've got QIJ and RJK terms. And these correspond directly with the decision variables I talked about before. But it's basically like the reward I get when I set one of my decision variables to 1. Um, for each rider, you have the earliest and the latest time that they can be picked up. Um, this is just kind of like a classical uh, way to formulate this problem. We talk about the vehicle routing problem with time windows, and uh, this is what we mean. And in practice, it makes a ton of sense. Like maybe you know you have to pick up your riders uh, at specific times in the future, or you pick up your goods when they're available at the warehouse at a specific time. Uh, and then lastly, we have some time model parameters and some time based constraints. Um, and in this case, we'll assume like we can always add delay to the schedule. So what we really care about is like the minimum times. So what's the minimum time it would take a particular driver to get to a particular rider? What's the minimum time it would take to go between one location and another? Right. Okay. So if you have all those decision variables and all those model parameters, um, then you can formulate this kind of problem of like which drivers pick up which riders and in what order and when do things happen. And it's this kind of like gnarly uh, optimization problem. You can tell it's it's like the assignment problem, but it's much larger. There's a lot more equations, a lot more terms. Um, you know, people have spent their whole career studying this problem. So, uh, you know, it might not all click immediately, but it's a, I think it's a fascinating like math problem and it's like enormously important in real life. Um, and I'll make my slides available so you can study this afterwards if you want. I have a question. Um, so when you talk about the 
reward, how how would that parameters actually be set up? Yeah, good question. Um, so you can think about maximizing the revenue of a trip. So you um, you might set these parameters so that for each decision variable, uh, sorry, like the the reward is based upon the revenue that your company makes for serving that particular trip request. So like when CIJ equals one, you're serving trip request for rider J. So you can set QIJ to be like the revenue you make when you serve the trip request for rider J. Um, and when you said DJK equal to one, that means you're committing to serving rider K. So you can set the reward that RJK to like the revenue you get when you serve rider K. Um, but that's just one way you can do it. I mean, yeah, there's there's lots of ways you can think about setting up these reward functions. Because if those rewards are de de uh, determined by the distance of their trips, uh, but not related to the time that when they are picked up, right. then it's, it's constant. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. you can change the sequences, but you still get the same, same amount of revenue as long yeah. as they've been picked up, right? That's exactly right. So um, the way this formulation works, you can uh, change the reward based upon the distances for the pickup. So like, um, in this case, you can set the rewards based upon like how long it would take driver I to get to rider J, or how long it would take to uh, get to rider K's location after you've dropped off rider J. So like this formulation allows you to consider driving distance, um, particularly like that deadheading portion that you're talking about. like. How long does it take the driver to pick up somebody when there's nobody in their car? Uh, that's one of the good things about this formulation. And I, yeah, I, I didn't talk about that, but yeah, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I don't want to go through the math in, in too much detail, but it's in the slides and you, um, you're welcome to look at, I'll provide a link afterwards and you can always ask me questions afterwards. Um, but basically you try to maximize this reward function, which might be like the revenue for your company. So actually um, when I applied for a position at Uber, they asked me about a problem sort of like this. And I said like, oh, I would maximize the profit of the company. And I set up this whole system of, of mathematical equations based on this idea of maximizing profit, and that's not what they do. <laughs> so uh, some companies maximize profit, but that's not, it's not exactly how Uber operates at the moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically you're maximizing some kind of reward function. Um, you have to make sure that each drivers only pick up one rider at a time. Um, these three Constraints kind of go together. These are all constraints about your binary decision variables. Um, and then you've got these other constraints on the bottom, and these are more about the pickup times. So each rider's pickup time has to be within the allotted time window. Um, that's kind of obvious, but that's an important constraint. And then you have to relate the time windows to these binary decision variables. So basically what this means is like for any particular rider, the time at which you say you're going to pick them up has to respect like each driver's schedule. Um, so it, you know, this is kind of complicated to unpack, but it's basically relating the binary variables to the pickup times. Um, so this is a, you know, not the most obvious way to formulate this problem. And like, maybe it's not the first thing you think of when you think of like a taxi service, but it's actually like a really efficient, way to kind of describe what happens in a taxi service or at the post office when you're trying to deliver packages. It's a, one of the reasons it's efficient is because if you look at all of the things I'm describing as, as decision variables, there's only two subscripts in any one term, like CIJ or DJK. There's nothing with more than two subscripts. Um, and that's actually like surprisingly difficult to, like it's pretty difficult to think of a formulation that works where there's only two subscripts on each of the decision variables. Um, and then if you look at all the equations, like I have constraints where I talk about what happens for each driver or for each rider. 
Um, but in each case, I'm only looking at one set of people, right? That first constraint, the sum of the CIJ terms is less than or equal to one. I have this constraint for every driver. Um, but I don't have it for like some combination of riders and, and multiple drivers or, you know, it's it's just there's only one group of. Uh, I'm only looking across one group of people, the drivers, and I have one of these constraints for each driver. So if I is the number of drivers and J is the number of riders, then I only have I plus four J constraints. And that's, you know, that's actually a really efficient way to kind of think about what a taxi service does. Um, so when I first saw this problem, the thing I did is I tried to fix all the binary decision variables, and then I tried to determine like what pickup times made sense. Uh, and that's a really easy problem to solve. Like if you know what each driver is going to do, then you just pick up each rider basically as soon as possible. Right? So that's one way to think about this problem. You know, at scale, you probably can't solve this problem to optimality, but maybe you can start with some assumptions and like get a pretty good solution. So maybe you can start with some driver assignments and then you can try to figure out like when I should pick up the riders and that's a pretty e easy problem it turns out. Um, but then one of the things that's interesting is you can flip that on its head. So I just saw a transportation engineering research paper that did like basically exactly the opposite of, of what I was trying to do. And they first picked the pickup times for each rider and then they went based on those pickup times and tried to plot out like paths for the drivers. Um, and yeah, it turns out that's also a really easy problem. Um, if you know when each rider is supposed to be picked up, then these final two equations become kind of trivial. Um, if you know when each rider is going to be picked up, it's very easy to say, like, is it within the time window that's that you've already set up for that particular rider? And then, it, you know, it's kind of obvious it either is or is not within that time window. Um, and then similarly with this last constraint, you know, this is trying to relate the pickup times to the driver assignments and like some driver assignments will be feasible like this driver can pick up this rider in time to meet the scheduled pickup time uh, and some assignments will not be feasible like no there's no way John can pick up David at the time specified right so these two constraints if you know when people are supposed to be picked up these become kind of uh, trivial you just know that certain things can happen and certain things can't happen in terms of driver assignments uh, and it turns out the top half of the problem is also, you know, pretty trivial if you know the uh, times at which people are going to be picked up. So this turns into a special kind of problem we call a network flow problem. Um, it's actually linear. Uh, you can remove these constraints that the decision variables have to be binary and you can find an optimal solution where just kind of naturally the decision variables become binary. <laughs> okay, sorry, that was a ton of math. But um, basically, if you encounter something like the vehicle routing problem in real life, um, just like with the assignment problem, you can try to code up your own algorithm for solving it. And maybe you can use a, you know, something you see in the research literature that other people have tried and, and found to work pretty well. So there's something called a two-op heuristic that works for all sorts of problems. You can pretty easily code that up yourself. Um, or you can just formulate the problem and throw it at one of these uh, solvers. So like Garobi or Cplex that I talked about last time. Um, but actually there's special solvers just for solving the vehicle routing problem because like it's such a fundamental problem at so many companies that, you know, in so many research papers. So there's uh, something called OptiPlanner, there's something called NextMV, and these are solvers like specifically designed to solve vehicle routing problems. Um, okay, so I first saw this problem um, when I was working at NASA. So we had a side project where we went to Hamburg Airport and we tried to optimize um, what, what the service vehicles do at Hamburg Airport. So these are like the luggage trailers and the fuel trucks. Um, and when you're managing like the fuel trucks at an airport, you have to decide like where it goes over the course of a day. And you know the flight schedule. So you know when flights are gonna arrive and depart and you have to decide like where the fuel trucks should go, which flights, which aircraft it should serve in which order. And it turns out like that's a vehicle routing problem. Right, so we had this project to kind of optimize how the fuel trucks and the luggage trailers moved at Hamburg Airport and it was called the Karma Project. And this was like my first exposure to the vehicle routing problem. Um, okay, so that Karma Project, 
to the extent that I was involved, it really looked exactly like the vehicle routing problem. But then I went to work at places like RAN and Uber uh, and Scoop, and you have all these real world complications that um, make things a lot harder. So like, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but there's laws in certain countries um, that vehicles have to return to their home base or like a depot or a garage after every time they serve a trip. So if you request an Uber in Germany and you take it from one location to another, some driver will take you and then they'll have to go back to some garage or some depot. Um, this is not just in Germany, this is in a lot of locations. This is not just applying to Uber. Um, you know, I personally, I think it's pretty terrible. Like it's a pretty terrible law. It's a pretty terrible regulation. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for uh, people who want to get picked up or dropped off certain places. It's not good for drivers. But like this is a real law and there's lots of laws like this. So maybe you're trying to solve the vehicle routing problem and you have to incorporate some sort of uh, strange regulation like this. Oh, Kenny. For that, is that also implemented in the US? I don't think it's in the US, no. I, I'm not an expert here, but I, I remember hearing um, Germany, maybe Spain, possibly South Korea, but like it's, yeah, it's certain countries and not others. And what's the reason for asking them to go back to the base? I think it's to make them look more like taxi services. Um, yeah, I don't I don't honestly know. This is a good yeah, this is a good public policy question. I wonder like what the motivation here is. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, yeah, so maybe if you're working at a company like Uber or Lyft, um, there's these regulations that you have to be aware of and you have to work them into your like mathematical calculations and your algorithm and you have to figure out how to abide by the regulations, but also operate as efficiently and safely as possible. Um, that's an example of something you might do as a as a data scientist at one of these companies. Um, if you're working at a place like like RAND where you're on the other side of the table, you're thinking about like what are the best regulations. Uh, you might think about something like this um, return to base type of law and you might want to know like what would the implications be? So there again, you'd have to model this type of regulation and you might think about like modeling a taxi company using something like the vehicle routing problem, but then you have to tweak it to account for a regulation like this. Um, so with the assignment problem, we had to figure out like what are the times it would take drivers to pick up riders. Uh, you would have to do that if you're trying to solve the vehicle routing problem as well, but it gets even more complicated because you also have to think about like how long would it actually take me to how long would it actually take each driver to pick up each rider and then drop them off? Um, so this became really apparent when I was working on Uber bus, right? It's like basically operating a bus service. How long does each bus actually stop at the bus stops? Um, like estimating that is, a, is an interesting problem on its own. Um, here again, like things get much harder as, as your operations scale up. So like solving the assignment problem is difficult when you have millions of riders and drivers, but it's impossible when you when you're talking about the vehicle routing problem. Like the math just doesn't scale. Um, again, like this is an online problem in real life for a lot of companies. So like, how often do I want to solve this type of problem? Should I reconsider decisions that I made in the past? Like those types of considerations are all still relevant. Um, just in general, like we have the same problems we had with the assignment problem, but everything gets more complicated, right? So maybe you want to ask riders to walk a little bit. Um, specifically for something like a bus service, that becomes really valuable, right? You want your bus to operate as efficiently as possible, and if it's got 10 people on board, you don't want to go on a long detour just to pick up one person when you could ask them to walk a little bit and save everybody some time. But like figuring out the optimal way to ask people to walk, like that's a, an interesting research problem. Um, in real life, it's even more challenging because like there's certain constraints on where people should be picked up or dropped off. You don't want to pick up or drop off people on a highway. Um, yeah, and then there's this question about fleet management that that is is particularly relevant for a lot of companies. So like if you're working at Amazon and you have this fleet of vehicles delivering packages. Um, one thing that you're very interested in is like how good are my different drivers? And maybe some drivers are much better than some other drivers. 
but like how can you learn that from the data and like how can you incorporate that into your decision making and how can you see when somebody's slacking off or how can you reward when somebody's doing a terrific job okay so yeah just in general there's all these kind of real life complications and if you're a data scientist at a company like amazon or uber a lot of your job is basically uh, trying to account for these complications that arise in real life. Okay, so that's all I had for you. Um, yeah, I was hoping to have some discussion and if you think of something later or if we run out of time, um, you can always email me after the fact. Thank you so much, Kenny, for bringing um, you know, the practical features and also the challenging problems from the, um, from the real kind of shared mobility industry to us. So, um, audience, do you have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, speak out your question. So, Kenny, maybe I, I continue to ask about one question. Is You mentioned that uh, the Uber didn't want to use the Google Map for millions of the quotes every day about the travel time. And the ways, if, if Uber has enough drivers and serves enough trips. Um, will, will they be able to kind of estimate the travel time by using their own data? <laughs> yeah, I can't say too much. I, I'm like, to be totally honest, I don't know that too much about that, but I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I see. And for the scoop company that you're working on, you mentioned that, that is for peer to peer sharing. Yeah, that's right. Um, so. Scoop is interesting because we work with large employers. Um, so like uh, LinkedIn will ask Scoop to help them uh, help their workers carpool to work. And then the workers can download the Scoop app and find somebody that they want to carpool with. And then, uh, yeah, so there's this like component where we're working with businesses and employers, but there's also this component where we're working with like individual people that want to carpool to work together. Oh, so. So when you say working with individual, that means you also have a platform that actually the users can register and um, obtain the service from your company to do so, right? Yeah, that's right. It works much better if you work at an employer that we work with, but um, you can definitely, everybody at home can download the Scoop app and try to see if they can carpool to work together. Um, yeah, it works much better if you work at LinkedIn or one of these companies that we partner with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any questions from students? Hello. Hey, hey, Kenny. Um, it's good to see you here. Good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious about uh, what will be the like the maximum uh, um, scope or scale of the, such a problem in real life. For example, like the Uber Uber company, what will be the maximum scale or how many how many maximum number of riders and the drivers that will be in the real life here in, like in the United States? Yeah, it's it's difficult for me to say because I worked I was kind of. Uh mainly working on the Uber bus project, and I was a little bit separated from my colleagues, but I would, yeah, yeah, I don't know if I should have your name. <laughs> uh, just, uh, okay. don't, you don't have to tell the specific <laughs> number, I'm, asking, because I'm thinking about the, maybe some other countries like in China, so they have similar problem, and then maybe they have a larger scale problem, yep. considering the number of riders and the drivers. It was definitely like on the order of thousands or, or you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> can't say too much, but like thousands. Okay. <laughs> and how fast does, does, does the algorithm you, you present in your presentation can, can, can run like online? So, um, like I got very interested in the vehicle routing problem at one point, and there's this, um, Paper by some MIT professors that I that I was looking at recently, um, and it's basically I would say less than half a second to solve like problems that involve thousands of of trip requests, um, oh. and that that matches with what I know about Scoop and Uber. Like we're talking about um, 
fractions of a second, thousands of trip requests, and like it's a lot about heuristics and not solving the optimality. So like how fast, how good can you get within uh, a fraction of a second, basically? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, any other questions from the audience? I guess not everybody's working from home. <laughs> not even drive. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, Dr. Kenneth Ku has his email address here. And uh, if you have, uh, you know, questions regarding his presentation or questions regarding the optimization uh, in the shared mobility, you can always shoot him an email after the, uh, you know, after this event. So again, I want to thank Dr. Ku for his presentation and thank you very much to bring, you know, your observations and your experience from the industry to our students. Thank you so much and a very nice seeing you here. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Thank you. Good yeah. to see you. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. And uh, next week, let's see. Next week, who will be our speaker? Anyway, uh, I guess you can check the website and find out. I just kind of.